Good evening, everyone, or good morning, if you're from uh, the north. Uh, I am Myling Perman. I'm uh, affiliated with the Fiji School of Medicine, otherwise the, known as the College of Medicine, Health Science, uh, Nursing and Health Science at the Fiji National University. I am, uh, in addition to uh, serving as uh, a member of the steering committee for the WGO's climate change webinar. I am also a co-director of the WGO Suva Training Center in Fiji. Uh, my uh, assistants or moderators for the uh, session, we have uh, Professor Rita Wakil and Professor KM4 uh, with us. Uh, also is Professor Desmond Ledin. And Professor Rida is with the Department of Tropical Medicine at Ain Shams University in Cairo, Egypt. In addition to serving on various WGO committees, he is the Permanent Secretary of the African Middle East Association of Gastroenterology. Uh, for Professor Falk, he is with the Duke and U.S. Medical School and Cheng Yi General Hospital in Singapore. Additionally, he serves as a member of WGO Climate Change Working Group as well. Uh, Professor Ledin is the chair of the WGO Climate Course for Global Gastroenterology. He is affiliated with uh, Dalhousie University in Halifax, uh, Canada. Now tonight, or this morning, we have uh, uh, very interesting uh, topics. Uh, our speakers for the night or for the session, we have uh, Professor Anthony Costello and Professor Covin Macaria. Professor Anthony Costello is affiliated with the UCL Institute for Global Health, University College London. He is the chair of the US, sorry, UCL Lancet Commission on Managing the Health Effects of Climate Change. Uh, he is also a board member of the Lancet International Advisory Board and um, board member of Welcome Bloomsbury Center for Tropical Medicine and mentor for, for, at the Academy of Sciences. In September 2015, Professor Costello joined the World Health Organization in Geneva as director of the Department of Maternal, Child, and Adolescent Health. Prior to this appointment, he was professor of international child health and director of the Institute for Global Health at University College London, UCL. His areas of specific Scientific expertise include evaluating community interventions to reduce maternal and newborn mortality, neonatal pediatrics, women's groups, the cost effectiveness of interventions, nutritional supplementation, and international aid for maternal and child health. He has contributed to papers on health economics, health systems, child development, uh, nutrition and infectious disease, and managing the health effects of climate change. Our second speaker, Professor Kovin Makaria, uh, is presently a professor in the Department of Gastroenterology and Human Nutrition, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, India. He received his training from the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research, Changira, and has trained 80 fellows in gastroenterology and nine PhD students. He has published 278 articles in index journals, 40 chapters for different books, and edited a handbook on celiac disease. He is the Secretary General of the Indian Society of Gastroenterology, Chair of WGO's Clinical Research Committee, Chair of WGO's Diet and Gut Guideline, and a Council Member of the Asian Pacific Association of Gastroenterology. So we have two uh, great speakers 
on session three for the um, WGO climate course for global gastroenterology. And session three is on food, water, security, and vulnerable populations. And uh, my, I'm Anthony Costello. I'm based at University College London. I'm a pediatrician, um, uh, an academic, and previously was uh, for a few years director at the World Health Organization for Maternal, Child, and Adolescent Health. And um, I'm going to share my screen right now. Uh, let's try that one. And I hope you'll have that in front of you. And I'm going to talk uh, to you about food insecurity, about malnutrition, uh, the causes of the causes and policy options. Now, there are three themes that I want to touch on a slight overview of the world's nutrition, what the climate and commercial impacts are, and mo most important, what are the policy options for the future? Now, there are huge challenges for nutrition in the world right now. Things are not getting better, they're actually getting worse. There's a post-pandemic economy, uh, the food and cost of living crisis. Uh, you will have seen in all your countries, I think, uh, a significant rise in inflation, very high in uh, England right now or, or in the UK. It's well above 10 percent. And actually, uh, food inflation is a, get, is above 18 percent. And this is due to a number of factors, pandemic stimulus, quantitative easing by the banks, the China lockdown, uh, supply constraints, and of course, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which has uh, inhibited the export of major food crops to many poorer countries. This is the food FAO food insecurity map, uh, which shows the usual pattern of disadvantage. But you'll see that there are a lot of gray areas that don't report figures and white areas, which are supposedly only zero to 10 percent of people who are food insecure. I'll come back to that. Um, we also know that extreme weather events linked to climate change drive up commodity prices. So in South America, we've seen the coffee price go up steeply after a severe frost affected the crop last July. In Europe, the potato price went up after flooding in Belgium and Germany. North America, pea price went up after an unprecedented heat wave in Canada. Uh Oh, here it is. It's shown again. Um, so we know that surprisingly, hunger and nutrition outcomes are not closely correlated with food availability. If you look at underweight children under the age of five, the relationship between being underweight and per capita food supply is pretty, you know, it's there, but it's not uh, tight. And as Amartya Sen said in his Nobel Prize winning book, Poverty and Famines, starvation is the characteristic of some people not having enough food to eat. It is not the characteristic of there not being enough food to eat. And he showed this in, in classically by studying the Bengal famine under British rule, when over a three to four year period, the wages actually went up by about 30%. But food costs, because it was a wartime boom economy, went up by 300 percent. And the, the 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 consequence was that they could not command entitlement to food and about two to three million people starved. Now, coming back to this in this country, in the United Kingdom, the sixth richest country in the world, uh, look at this. In, in January, we see that the percentage of households going up, this is a very recent survey, has soared in the last uh, six to nine months. Um, not, that's one in, one in five, six uh, adults in the country experience food insecurity. When you look at the number of ch adults not eating for a whole day, it's gone up to about uh, 16, 17 percent. And when you look at all the households on universal credit, which is the sort of baseline security payment, 50 percent are experiencing food insecurity. So in any wealthy country, you're going to find uh, disadvantaged people. And if your Gini coefficient inequality rates are high, 
you're going to have hidden hunger. And this is what we're seeing in the UK, in America, in many parts of Europe. So don't believe that this is just about low income countries. Now, the climate crisis. You've had, uh, no doubt, a terrifying lecture by Hugh Montgomery, uh, who has presented all the brutal realities of the climate crisis. He's probably shown you how really nothing has shifted the upward rise in carbon dioxide levels, despite all these meetings and accords and COPs and agreements. And we're seeing a lot of feedback loops uh, worsening wildfires, the loss of the reflection from the ice caps of solar radiation, the so-called EBITDA effect, methane release, rainforest now as net emitters. And he may have mentioned some of these many climate tipping elements, which are helping to speed up the process of climate change. He may have mentioned a recent science paper uh, from last November, I think it was, which said that exceeding 1.5 degrees will triple, will trigger multiple climate tipping points. And we indeed published a commentary in The Lancet. No, that was in November. I think the science was September, where we said, look, this is threatening our health and survival for our children within decades. And he will have talked about The Lancet countdown. And some of us are slightly in despair that we're publishing these annual reports with groups, 100 universities from all around the world, but it seems to fall on deaf ears. And this is rather depressing that when you look from the last countdown report at the overall energy system, yes, some high, uh, very high income groups are seeing declines in the carbon intensity of the energy system, but that's more than offset by uh, medium income and uh, uh, high income, uh, high human development index groups. And the overall effect is that uh, over the past 30 years, the carbon intensity of the global energy system has fallen by about 1%. So this is not encouraging. And we we took the gloves off in the last report. The subheading was global health at the mercy of fossil fuels. Um, and just hand picking a few key findings, which Hugh may have given you, but it, it's important to emphasize. On average, you know, I was born in the 1950s. And since that time, 29 percent, nearly a third more of the global land area is being affected by extreme drought annually. Uh, another thing relevant to food security is the fact that high temperatures during growing seasons lead to a much faster crop maturation. And this reduces the maximum potential yield that could be achieved if there were no limitations of water or nutrients, which there may be at the same time. And again, you can see that just relative to that period up to 2010, in 2021, you see really dramatic falls in the crop growth season by nine days in maize, uh, less for rice, six days for winter and spring wheat. And this is likely to continue. Uh, and as CO2 rises, um, a study from Harvard showed that micronutrient levels in food tend to decline. And then if you look at the sea, Temperatures are going up, the oceans are being acidified, reduced oxygenation, uh, and you're looking at temperatures of about uh, 0 0.7 degrees up of seawater. And the, the jagged orange line was the difference between 2000 and 1980. And the red line is now the difference between 2020 and 1980, roughly. So this is getting worse and it's affecting uh, the productivity of marine life as well. And then migration, we know that migration, we, we can't actually quantify migration due to climate change. It's too difficult, but we know that <clears throat> there are major changes in water and soil quality and supply, uh, the livelihood, security, flooding, saltwater intrusion are just some of the health impacts of sea level rise. 
about 150 million people are settled less than one meter. But if you go to less than 10 meters, you're you're getting on for about three to four times that that number. And most of them in coastal cities, which are the heartbeat and economic center of most countries in the world. And all of those will be affected by storm surges and the like. And we don't know yet about the exponential rise in sea level. It may take off later this century faster than people think. And then, of course, what are the fossil fuels doing? companies doing? Well, they've um, they've actually uh, made uh, getting on for a trillion dollars worth of profits just in the last year since the Ukraine crisis. And the current strategies of their oil uh, uh, excavation and gas excavation will lead to production exceeding levels consistent with limiting the, the average surface temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. And that would exceed levels by 37% in seven years and 103% in 17 years. Now, the commercial impacts on nutrition run in tandem to this. We know that obesity is a massive issue expanding across the whole world, particularly in, in the United States, in the Middle East, uh, but in many other parts of the world uh, as well. And um, uh, ending childhood obesity is a, is a key priority uh, because we know that this uh, is a major cause of um, uh, heart attacks, of strokes, of diabetes and the like. And so the origins of adult disease lie in childhood. And we know that um, sugar taxes and junk food is a major contributor to this which requires government regulation. And we know from various trials and um, policy changes that reducing uh, or increasing taxes on sugary drinks can reduce consumption. Uh, in the UK, they did it differently. They put a, they said, we're putting a tax on high sugar drinks. And so you've seen a big change towards zero or low sugar drinks. Um, but this is a, a complex issue. Now, when I was at WHO, we put forward a, a, a resolution for a global child obesity strategy, went to the World Health Assembly. We didn't envisage there'd be massive problems. And yet two countries or several countries raised concerns about the, the text. We were sent away to another room for about six hours and uh, a certain country that shall, well, no, it's the United States, and Italy, after six hours, refused to endorse this strategy, which meant that it was not unanimously passed. And indeed, the same thing had happened the year before. The obesity one was during the Trump um, Trump administration, whereas the um, uh, commercial um, ban on advertising of uh, formula milks and the inappropriate advertising was the year before actually under President Obama. And on this occasion, again, the policy that was put forward by the uh, World Health Organization was blocked by the United States, by Europe, Europe, European Union, UK, New Zealand, and the big dairy producers. Um, and we know that sanitation, we many more people have mobile phones than toilets. Over 1.7 billion people still have no basic sanitation services. Around 500 million practice open defecation. And we estimate uh, around 800,000 people in lower middle income countries die as a result of water sanitation, and poor hygiene. And that's 60 percent of all uh, diarrheal deaths. So what are the policy options? I mean, this is a pretty gloomy scenario and things are not getting better in the world post pandemic and in the era of geopolitical uncertainty and conflict. We, uh, when I was at WHO, we set up a commission chaired by Helen Clark and Awakol Sek, who, uh, you know, Helen Clark, former prime minister of New Zealand, our Colsec Minister of State in Senegal, who's also a paediatrician. And we produced uh, over three years with 41 commissioners from around the world, uh, something on uh, entitled A Future for the World's Children? Question mark. 
with WHO and UNICEF, and uh, but as an independent uh, publication. And it was all about children in all policies, because we know that if you really uh, want to cut deaths of young people between five and up to 29, road injury is the commonest cause. In some uh, countries, it would be homicide. Um, agriculture and trade is massive for nutritional effects, subsidies, trade rules, food policies, and all of these influence obesogenic diets. Urban planning, most of the poorer countries lack playable spaces in their cities. There is unregulated building and most green spaces are eliminated. And air pollution, 99% of children breathe unsafe air. That's a WHO figure. And it not just affects the lungs, but it increases the risk of uh, cardiovascular disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes, and metabolic syndrome. And going on, family services. Helen Clark was very strong on housing, that 40% of children live in informal settlements. And all of these factors of overcrowding health hazards will contribute to gastrointestinal disease, obesity, poor nutrition, as well as the limitations on education. Yes, many more children are going to school, but often the quality of education leaves a lot to be desired. Um, since we published that, we have set up a grouping called Children in All Policies. We have a small secretariat at UCL, but it's linked with WHO and UNICEF. And we're working actively with nine countries and many other commissioners from other parts of the world. And one of the things that came out of the report and what we're what we're trying to work on now is how to act on climate. You know, you've got to stop greenhouse gas emissions as quickly as possible. Collective action is the duty of everyone. Um, and we know that we're way off course. I, I, I don't know if you showed you this, but um, we should be going down the blue line um, or if not the green line, we're actually on the red line. So, you know, we are nowhere near approaching a, a path to net zero and our nationally determined contributions are, are certainly not anywhere in the ballpark of where we want to get to. Uh, so that is very gloomy. Um, but, and I should emphasize this, you know, we have to stay hopeful and not just give up. And really everything we do for climate change is good for your health and everything we do to improve your health is good for climate change. And net zero is possible because of government action, because of corporation action. I include businesses, institutions, hospitals, universities, and of course, individuals. And it, it, it's not a cost. It's, it will save the world trillions of dollars from future damage and through health improvements. And this is just some of them. You'll know a lot about this, that all of us, all of us, and especially the medical profession, have to be promoting renewable energy, uh, moving away from fossil fuels, getting governments to cut subsidies, building active and public transport or encouraging it as individuals and institutions, carbon neutral buildings, reforesting, recycling, reducing all our waste. And of course, 30 percent of emissions come from land use, agriculture, and so food systems that are more plant based and much more localized are incredibly important. We've known all this for 30 years, 40 years, and we just need to make sure that this happens at a faster pace. And all of us, particularly you, most of you listening to this, are very influential in your countries. And I think we all need to play a part in this. Um, over the part, I've done a lot of research in my time on looking at community mobilization, uh, particularly through women's groups in poorer countries. And we showed in seven trials and we published a, a meta-analysis of this that mobilizing women's groups was a very effective way of cutting newborn mortality, even in very poor remote rural populations with little access to uh, maternity care. And um, 
by mobilizing it's it it sounds silly that you're just chatting and coming up with uh repeat meetings where they discuss their own strategies and implement them but you know a lot of things happen safe delivery kits hand washing families supporting one another postnatal care use of bed nets they set up their own credit funds breastfeeding communication solidarity and the like so groups are important and we've since done a, a trial published in the Lancet, led by Ed Fottrell and, and Kishwar Azad, uh, showing again where we compared community groups or mobile phone messaging or a control group, that actually community groups were a way of dramatically reducing the prevalence of prediabetes and, and, and diabetes as a collective outcome by about 60%. And this is, I think, very important. If this was a drug, I'd be a billionaire. But because it's uh, community mobilization, it doesn't get much attention. But I think this is very important. And linked to that, this is a project that has been run by my colleague, Nami Saville, in Nepal. She's lived there for many years. And with a very good Nepali team to think about ways of improving both climate change adaptation and nutrition at the same time. And so she, instead of getting students to strike about the climate, they are given apps and they uh, go out and about with their teachers and look at their local environment, the local flora and fauna, pests, hazards and the like. And they did this as a pilot study. They all loved it, by the way, but they could identify pests, document landslides, failed crops, agricultural land ruined by flash flooding. And the Middle Hills of Nepal are very affected by climate change. And so our idea is that we could use this as a method to engage with children, build up the understanding of citizen science, of scientists of, our, of their local environment, feed it back into um, the uh, local communities and then have a participatory group process uh, to look at the impacts on dietary diversity and also on performance of their agriculture because you can use satellites down to 10 square meters where you can look at green growth you can look at water content of soil and with a bit of supportive lab work you can look at soil carbon trapping which of course would be a very financially sustainable way to scale this up because that's what every finance house in the world is looking for carbon sequestration um clearly women and children must be at the center not just of the sdgs but of climate change um uh and nutrition action and if we don't do that we are really betraying our descendants and and, and it, we, one can't put it more brutally than that one thing is how to engage with policymakers over the past year with WHO and UNICEF we've helped set up a, a simple uh, line of colored dots for policymakers to see how they're performing on all the child health related SDG indicators at different ages and contextual factors do go and have a look at that. Just type into WHO UNICEF or CAP uh, 2030. You'll, you'll see an example of this. And the question then is, will this stimulate and focus their minds on particular things that they can pay attention to, like nutrition and early childhood development? And we need to emphasize to people that even the countries on the left here with low indicators of child flourishing like the Central African Republic uh, are green. They are not emitting into the atmosphere, whereas all the wealthy countries, examples at the top, are they may have children flourishing now, but they're poisoning our children's future. Finally, unified multi-sectoral action sounds very boring, but the most important thing as a researcher, you know, I've spent most of my life doing stuff but how do you get it into policy? How do you actually influence policymakers? And we've been thinking a lot about this and working now uh, in several countries where we're trying to get policymakers to look at these dashboards, think about what they're going to tackle in the context of existing initiatives, uh, identify relevant policy options, which 
policies will they actually choose and why is it finance is it ideological and then how you implement them and then come back to your dashboard now that's a very naive view in one sense but that's what happens in countries and we've got to find out what's most likely to make it happen if you engage with people you don't shout at them you don't tell them what to do but give them the opportunity to consider this finally uh, a massive issue we all face for overconsumption, overnutrition, is the improper use of children's data by social media multinationals. This is a highlight from the paper today, April the 5th, TikTok fined a trivial amount, in my view, for misusing children's data. We know that children are groomed, but the huge impact of having all their details hoovered up by Facebook, Google, and many other big companies who then target them with ads from a very young age. And all of our children are exposed to this because children love being on phones and iBooks and the like. I'll end there. Thank you very much for listening. These are the causes of the causes. Don't be afraid to use your white-coated authority to add your voices powerfully to policy decisions. Thanks very much. Yes, our next uh, talk is by Professor Kovin Makaria. He'll be talking on vulnerable populations and migration. Uh, thank you, Myling Perman, Dr. Kieran Falk, and Dr. Arida el -Wakil. Today we are at the third session of a webinar on climate course for global gastroenterology, which is brought to you by World Gastroenterology Organization. Our greetings to you from WGO. My name is Gobind Makaria, and I'm a professor at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, India. In this, in this talk, I will highlight uh, on vulnerable population and migration, which is induced by climate change. The objective of uh, this talk is to understand how are people affected by the climate change? Who are the people at risk? What is the magnitude of climate migrants? The health consequences in climate migrants and what are the mitigation strategies? Coming one by one. First, we all we know that 80 to 90% of all disasters from natural hazards during past 10 years have resulted from floods, droughts, tropical cyclones, heat waves, and severe storms. And these have been uh, the major cause of uh, uh, climate uh, effects. Take, for example, floods in 2019 itself in UK, in certain part of UK, it rained so much in 48 hours, which was equivalent to one month rain. And that led to flooding in certain part of United Kingdom. People believe that uh, our risk to flood is only once in a lifetime. But in today's time, it is not so. The same population can have a flood again in the same region uh, because, of, uh, uh, because of change in climate. And that can lead to displacement, which could be temporary or permanent. I can take another example. As there's a rise in sea level, which leads to flooding in many regions, the many part of the world, including small towns, villages, and even big towns are flooded. For example, take in Venice, the water level is, is increasing so much, and people believe that uh, Venice will disappear in coming uh, decades. So is in Bangladesh. Almost 17% of land of Dhaka, which is the capital of Bangladesh, can be submerged because of flooding and can displace as many as 18 million people by 2050. Mine, we must know that Bangladesh produces a little amount of carbon. Other example, Jakarta, which is the capital of Indonesia. Again, water level is rising, and, and it may be underwater by 2050, and therefore they're making a new city to, to replace their capital. Similarly, people believe that Miami, uh, the level of sea is rising, and Miami may not be seen at the end of the century. Take other point. One part is flood. Look at second part is drought. Drought also affects 
is not also brought about climate change. And it is believed that 15 million people are displaced by or affected by drought globally. So one side is flooding, second side is drought. And all these to lead to so much of climate effects. Moving on further, fire. Fire in the uh, different forest and this fire can lead to multiple effects and mainly by displacement. Fire will displace a lot many people who reside close to uh, forests. So all, of, all, of, all, all do this together leads to what kind of effect on humans. Extreme heat lead to heat related uh, disorders, heat strokes and also cardiovascular events. The rising sea level will lead to displacement and even drowning. The air pollution lead to asthma and allergies and cardiovascular diseases. Similarly, the water contamination will lead to infection, GI infection and other infection that can lead to diarrhea. The change in vector ecology because of water contamination and water stagnation after flooding can lead to vector-borne disease disorders. Also, loss of home and, and inhabitant lead to physical and mental health effects. And all of these uh, leads to food security or insecurity that can lead to malnutrition and other disorders. So look at every aspect of health is affected by climate change. Coming to the second part, of these climate change, who are the people at risk of uh, getting affected? And it's simply said that no one, everyone is, almost everyone will be affected by climate change and its, its effects. And it's expected or it's believed that almost half of world population reside in areas which are vulnerable to climate change. So who are the people who are most affected? And for example, take pregnant ladies. They are more prone to heat related disorders, mental health, respiratory disorders, infection and nutrition. And all of these, uh, in addition to affecting the pregnant lady, it also can affect a baby growing in the uterus and can lead to low birth weight, development anomalies and even preterm birth. Infants, as you know, infants and toddlers have immature immune system. So therefore, they are more prone to infection. And also, they have limited ability to acclimatize. And therefore, they are at more prone to or more sensitive to climate change stresses. Children and youth, because of climate change, flooding, increase uh, ambient temperature, they are not able to play outdoor. That's so, so important for growth of uh, uh, children. And also, they are also affected by various disorders caused by climate change. All adults are, uh, are susceptible to get affected by climate effects. And, and lastly, elderly people, they are more sensitive. They are more sensitive to climate change. They are at higher risk of social isolation or dependence. And furthermore, they, have, they are difficult to prepare for responding to extreme weather conditions, including evacuation if required to be done because of climate effects. In addition to those, uh, in addition, those people who are, who are, who are uh, especially in, in the uh, tribal areas, they are also affected by climate a change. And more importantly, that uh, all these effects also affect physical activity. High ambient temperature, flooding leads to negative impact on physical activity levels. So therefore, increase in obesity, which itself is a, is a epidemic globally. In addition to the ever population, those people who are affected most, those who are weak economically, those who are poor, those people who are indigenous population, people with disabilities, those with pre-existing illness, and also the frontline emergency responders. The key point is that uh, if you are poor, either individual or as a society or as a country, you are most likely to be affected by climate change. And also, if we have a poor responsive society and government who does not care for climate effects or its population, they are most likely to be affected by climate change. So oh, in the world, which region is affected the most? And it is said 
that those countries which are least developed or those countries which are conflict, conflict affected, they are the most developed nations which leads to climate or which gets affected by climate change. And also, they're not able to cope up with effects of climate change because they are less developed and they don't have enough infrastructure to take, to take care of people who are affected by climate change. Which are the countries which are the highest risk? And this, uh, the data which is brought by German Watch. German Watch is a, a non-government organization who, who watches the effect of climate uh, in different countries. And this is data of uh, 2010 to 2019. But latest data suggest that those countries which are higher risk of climate change are Mozambique, Zambia, Bahamas, even Japan, Malawi, Afghanistan, India, South Sudan, and many other countries. Of all these, as I said, that uh, every human is uh, at risk, but some are affected severely, and, and, and they have to migrate. For example, th those people staying around the, the sea coast, coastal areas and there's a flooding that increases sea levels, there are sea floods to neighboring area and that leads to uh, drowning of people and uh, therefore the whole inhabitant has to migrate. Now coming to the third aspect of this talk, that is what is the magnitude of uh, climate migrants? Those people who are affected by climate and they have to move from one area to other area, they are called climate migrants. So as we know, WHO estimates that globally of 8 billion people, almost 1 billion people are migrants worldwide. About one fourth which are international migration and about three fourths which are in, within their own countries. Migration is in part and parcel of uh, humanity. And migration occurs with two forces, the pull force that you migrate to other country or other region in your own country because of a better education, because of better job prospects, or because of better economy. That's good migration. But they are, they are, their migration also occurs because of push force, that you are pushed to migrate from one region to other region. And, and that happens because of adverse climate conditions, flooding, fire, and all these push people to migrate from one region to other region. So that three type of climate migrants, number one, is a forced displacement. They are forced to move immediately. Second, this, and second, that they are close slow movement means, uh, means there is an impediment risk of, of uh, flooding or any adverse climate effects, then people move slowly from one region to other region. And third, which is the best to happen, is a plant resettlement. It means that uh, there are government or society prepares homes for people who are at risk of, risk of climate effect, and they are moved from one region to other region in a more planned manner. The worst one is a forced displacement. So what is the number of people who are likely to be climate migrants? And this is data which come by World Bank, published in 2021, and it suggests that by 2050, there will be 260 million people will have to move or migrate within their own country. The largest being from Sub-Saharan Africa, 86 million people. East Asia, 50 million people. South Asia, 40 million. North Africa, 19 million. Latin America, 17 million. Eastern Europe uh, and Central Asia, 5 million people. And the good thing that 80% of this migration can be prevented if all of us together, along with our government, works and decreases the effect of climate, means carbon production. Therefore, each one of us have a responsibility to decrease our own carbon footprint. So once the once a person migrates from one region to other region because of adverse climate conditions, they have, in addition to loss of home, their jobs, their savings, they also have health consequences. And what are those? Infection, violence, abuse, both physical and sexual, trauma, mental health, 
in for nutrition. In addition, maternal and child health. Think of a pregnant lady and there's a flood. The pregnant lady has to move from one region to other region where she will not find a adequate care of their pregnancy. And that can affect child health and childbirth. In addition, the, every, uh, the climate effect can affect every system of our body. And, and it also, while, the, while there is a chronic diseases, but if somebody has a chronic disease, the care of chronic disease is also compromised during climate, to climate migrants. And of all, uh, the most important infection is, uh, is GI infection, and uh, diarrhea is the most common cause of infection in climate migrants. And it's so important, and diarrhea can take lives also. Why there's a high risk, high risk of infection in them is understandable. Poor sanitation in the climate, uh, climate, area, uh, climate affected areas or in the, in, the, in the refugee camps, the poor sanitation of water and food, poor personal hygiene, lack of basic, uh, basic necessities, even food and water which is safe, and inadequate public health resources. And all of these uh, uh, leads to uh, high risk to infection. In addition, uh, uh, in addition, they also have a challenge with their mental health. And this is a systematic review which suggests that uh, those climate migrants, if they are not taken care of appropriately, they have a worse depression. If they are marginalized, they have a three times higher risk of uh, anxiety disorders. And if they are separated from the family, the six times higher risk of uh, anxiety related symptom in them. Interestingly, if they're integrated in the, in the society, they have a less depressive symptoms. And uh, it's all well known that adverse climate effects or any kind of major trauma leads to post-traumatic stress disorders, which can last longer. And that can also result in high frequency of uh, uh, functional GI disorders in them. Those people who migrate have chronic disease, their care suffers. All through the three phases, that they, once they start migrating from one part to other part, and as they settle into new colony, because of interruption of continuous management, improper care of complication, the provision for follow-up, and also lack of medication. And therefore, the chronic disease care is affected in them. And therefore, they are at high risk of uh, complications. All we know that they need healthcare facility, which, which plays a central role in care of population. But because of adverse climate effect, the, the healthcare facilities are also affected. And that's so important that they, you need more health care, you need more healthcare facility, but they're also affected by climate. There's a greater need, but there's an inappropriate setup. There's a lack of infrastructure in those regions and also lack of trained personnel to take care of uh, all, all the disorders which the people might have. And in addition, one must realize, once the climate change occurs, once uh, migration occurs, those people who are more educated, they migrate further high to bigger cities. And therefore, there's a lack of healthcare personnel in the region where there are climate migrants. While we want to know more about it, what happened to climate migrants, but for literature is uh, still limited and is emerging. So coming to last part, uh, which is uh, mitigation strategies. And we know that uh, we'll have a special sessions on this webinar series on mitigation strategies. But I'll just highlight a couple of points out here. We require sustainable development and the component of sustainable development is uh, mitigation in all sectors, including health, environment protection and regulations by governments, enhancing social resilience and equity, and public health adaptation, which is, the, which is very important and center of preventing health consequences of climate change. By increasing our healthcare system, enhancing primary health care, 
excellent plan and preparedness in, in regions where climate, adverse climate effects are going to happen. The sovereign strategy and integration of health in all the policies, including climate migrants. To sum up, that we all know that climate change is happening and is going to happen. Climate change leads to multiple adverse climate effects like flooding, increase in sea level, fire, storms, and therefore almost half world population is vulnerable to get affected by climate change. Those people who are, who are economically weaker or those countries which are economically weaker are most affected. Adverse climate condition leads to multiple health effects. Therefore, each one of us should, should pledge to reduce our own carbon production or carbon footprint. And government and societies should consider sustainable plan. With that, thank you so very much and uh, happy to take any question. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Professor Makaria. That's a, another very uh, interesting topic. Thank you for sharing your uh, wide knowledge in this uh, area. Uh, we're now on to the questions and discussions. Uh, we have our panelists here and our moderators. Um, Yes, can we have uh, Professor Falk and this, uh, oh. I think Rita has not joined us yet, Mei Ling. Um, oh, okay, You're right. So I think uh, we probably have one question I can see in the Q and A's. Professor Falk? I, I thought you might want to take that question because it's uh, coming from a very high level, talking about governmental support. But uh, uh, I'll dodge, uh, I'll duck that question for the time being, but uh, I'd like to zoom in on what uh, Govin has actually uh, mentioned, that uh, each of us have a role to play and uh, we should have a sustainable uh, plan how we can help uh, to overcome the climate change burden. Now, so uh, could you elaborate a little bit about that, uh, Govit? Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Falk. Uh, certainly, yes, that uh, the, each one of us, each uh, of our activity as an individual, as a home, as a society, or as a profession, uh, we do produce uh, uh, many of our activities produces carbon. Some of them are essential, but some of them are preventable. And uh, in the first webinar, uh, Dr. Ledin has highlighted upon this, that uh, how do you reduce your own carbon footprint? For example, that unnecessary travel or reducing your own travel or using mass uh, transport system in your society, likewise. I see, but uh, over to uh, Costello, uh, what actually happens is that uh, there seems to be, there appear to me that there is a lot of uh, emphasis on the, the role of uh, children and women in the, the fight against climate change. Could, 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 could we hear a little bit more because he has just illustrated uh, with a few examples. And uh, also in, in terms of infrastructure, which uh, we, if we as doctors are involved, when we plan hospitals, are there things that we can do to, so that uh, we can reduce uh, the amount of uh, uh, GHG, you know, uh, that is being emitted? So anyone can answer that. I, I, uh, we, we, we can all throw in our ideas, I think. So not confined to the two speakers. Maybe Desmond or Bishra uh, uh, would also want to chip in. Yeah, let's bring Bishra in on this. Bishra, what do you think? Uh, thank you, Des, and thank you, Dr. Park. So uh, I, uh, the, the kind of examples are actually were mentioned, for example, one is the uh, community groups. Uh, the, uh, you know, Professor Rastillo talked about women community groups and impact that, that that has been having. It sounds like it's simple measures, but the impact of the simple measures, I think, can be tremendous. 
So we, as gastroenterologists, we have multiple societies and organizations. So we already have the communities. We just have to get those communities to work together um, because um, the, the, this kind of educational sort of opportunity, you know, exposure that we're having now at these presentations, I think the hope anyway, is that uh, there will be some actionable uh, efforts that will be taken at, within all our societies to try to really take uh, talk into action. And this really has been the problem uh, globally as was already articulated uh, uh, in both presentations. So, um, and, but, but it would be helpful, I think, if we collectively could come up with specifics. Maybe can come up, uh, for example, with a dashboard of indicators. I really like that, that, that concept. Of, uh, and then just have a list of things that are, uh, and then look at over time, who's doing what? Because that I think will maybe put some peer pressure on all of us to try to move uh, the needle forward. Hmm. Yeah. Jeffrey, what do you think? Thank, thanks, Des. Look, I think a uh, fantastic talk, Gavin. Thank you very much. And I think putting that together uh, with Anthony Costello's talk, Anthony, uh, he came down with three simple concepts. There's government action, there's corporate action, there's in individual action. And he made one connection between them, which is the power of the medical profession. So we obviously, in this series, we're talking about the impact of climate change on health, and that's obviously uh, the reason we're here. But I think the message coming through is that we have connections with our patients, we have connections with industry, and we have connections with government. And so I think we can use that influence not only to do, to as Govin said, to look at our own footprint and impact uh, that we're having and and uh, to reduce that imp uh, that uh, uh, our footprint. But at the same time, I think we need to constructively think of how we can make those connections. Uh, certainly, it's interesting in Australia just this week, um, some major corporations have made the decision to stop fossil fuel, but at the same time, they're working on how they can work, uh, produce steel uh, through no fossil fuel activity. Now, that's something that 10 years ago, they were saying it was impossible. And the, the activities, I think, with people like the medical profession, working with scientists, working with academics, to have this uh, working... Uh, ongoing, continuing to have that influence. I think that's going to be a really important way forward. Well, uh, that's a question there, uh, Mylene. Yes, uh, I think uh, there are a couple of questions. One, probably to the panel uh, from Lalita Chin, uh, Chindal. Uh, the question, uh, well, basically comment and question. Thank you for your insights and an update with fresh data. I wonder how do you get wealthy doctors on board with eco-friendly <laughs> living? Any modes of eco villages for medical community? Anyone wants to tackle that? Amazing. I think we're nearly up, but very quickly, I would say that our task right now is to follow through with what we're doing, to raise awareness in the medical community globally. And it's through that that we'll get action. With regard to eco-villages, sign me up. I'll be the first to join that one. <laughs> I think we're out of time, Mei Ling, and maybe if you want to introduce uh, the next, uh, the next uh, session in two yes. weeks' time, that would be terrific. Yes, yes. yes. Thank you, everyone. Uh, just a reminder. Uh, that, uh, you know, we have bi-weekly webinar series and the next session, which is session four, is on adaptation, resilience, and industry partnership. And this will take uh, place on 19th of April. A recording of this uh, webinar will be available on WGO's website uh, and an email with link will be sent to all registrants. So. Thank you all for uh, taking uh, time out of your busy schedule to be here. And those of you who are ready to go to sleep, uh, have a good night and a very good morning to everyone else. Thank you. Thanks. Well done. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Mayling. Thank you.